I want to go now into the message of hope, eternal life. Now, I want to continue through our study of eternal life. Now, why is it important for a believer to, to actually understand what eternal life is? Because, let's be honest, most Christians, when you ask them what's eternal life, they say, well, something I get when I prayed a prayer and got saved and something we talk about when I die at the funeral. Eternal life is the foundation stone of a believer's hope in the fact that we were dead and now we've been given this hope of eternal life, life everlasting to come. Uh, it gives us the strength. It gives us the perseverance. It gives us the ability to walk through any crisis, circumstance, distress that we could imagine because of this great hope. So let's continue. So last week I started to talk about our three residences of eternal life. We talked about Number one, which was heaven. And we said heaven is the current throne of Heavenly Father. Now, I know that there's been life after death experiences people have had, and they've seen the colors and the gardens and all that, and those are beautiful experiences. But Scripture is always our basis. And in Scripture, it tells us that heaven is the throne right now of Heavenly Father. And heaven can't even contain all of God. God is so magnificent. Our Heavenly Father is so, uh, uh, what's the word, just incredibly magnificent that the heavens and the earth can't contain Him. It tells us He has to humble Himself, it says in the Psalms, just to look upon the things of the earth and the things of heaven. Now, we talked about that last week, so you can catch up and watch the video if you missed it. If you're watching by Facebook or by YouTube, just look up for part seven. And so today I want to talk to you about eternal life as it refers to earth, the physical kingdom of God come to earth. Jesus, the word of God made flesh, his physical return to planet earth to establish his kingdom. The nations aren't going to like it. The governments aren't going to like it. The military leaders can't stop it, but it's going to happen. Jesus will be returning. And then later, not today, but next week, we're going to talk about the new earth. And the new earth is that renewed earth at the end of the 1,000 year, millennial reign of Messiah, when that city, that holy city called New Jerusalem, comes down from God out of heaven and establishes itself on the new earth. And Heavenly Father comes with it. And we're there, and all in all is completed in that beautiful city. And we'll talk about that in the future. So I want to talk about number two, about the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, earth, the physical kingdom of God, come to earth. I want to start in a passage of scripture, again, that most of us are familiar with. It's found in Matthew chapter 6. And the disciples had come to Jesus. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. John's taught his disciples to pray. Teach us to pray, Lord. And so Jesus begins to teach them how to pray, to teach them the outline of prayer. And he says in verse 6, But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. In the secret place. And your father who sees what in secret will reward you openly. So the first place, again, and this ties in with where we were just were about uh, humbling ourselves, praying and seeking his face, this is found and done in secret. I know we live in a time where we love the big rallies and the big crusades and uh, the prayer gatherings, and those are wonderful things. But what makes those things, when we come together publicly, more powerful is if we're learning to pray privately in secret. You see, your prayer life starts not in public, but your prayer life starts in secret. Your prayer life doesn't start in church. Your prayer life starts in the bedroom, in the bathroom, in the closet. It starts on the side of your bed. It starts right where you're at. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then verse 7 it says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
I've heard even spirit-filled believers get caught up in this mess. Somebody once was dying of cancer and a preacher told them, you just need to say I'm healed by his stripes 100 times and God's going to heal you. Listen, I believe that by his stripes we're healed, but vain repetition and prayer is not the way. It's based on relationship, guys. Relationship. A relationship, an abiding relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day. There are no magic potions or magic formulas. It's about abiding in the vine and he abiding in us. So this idea of vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard, it says in verse 7, for their many words. Then verse 8 it says, Therefore, Jesus says, don't be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. Well, he knows before we ask him what we need. He doesn't say don't pray. He just says don't keep uh, uh, vain repetition over and over like they do. Now in verse 9, this is what's fascinating. You say, I thought we were talking about the kingdom, Pastor. We are. We're going to get there. Let me show you. So in verse 9, Jesus goes on and the Lord says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, his kingdom is here, but it's not here. His will is done on earth, but it's not done on earth. What do I mean by that? I'm going to explain it to you. You see, your kingdom come right here is future tense. The physical kingdom of God is coming. The Jews were astonished because they could never grasp the fact that the physical kingdom of God was not coming when Messiah came. They didn't understand that there was an interval, an interlude, in which the kingdom of God would come in the hearts of men first before the physical kingdom of God would arrive. And you and I are in the time when the kingdom of God has arrived in the hearts of those men and women around the planet who have committed their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But the physical king and the physical kingdom will yet arrive at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom exists only where the Lord is king. You see, if there's a kingdom and you're not subject to the king, you're not a part of the kingdom. So the kingdom exists only where the Lord is king. So if the Lord is king of your life, if the Lord is king of my life, if the Lord is king of another believer's life, then the kingdom of God is there because his kingship is there. They are subjected to the king. Do you understand that? Now, look at this. Lord Jesus is king over the lives of his people. So that is where his kingdom right now is, the kingdom of God. So when we're praying your kingdom come, we're speaking two senses. We're speaking, Lord, I want your kingdom to come in my life today. I want your will to be done on this earth in my life today because my life is submitted and subjected to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But I also want the physical kingdom of God to come. I want your will to be accomplished, not just in the lives of the believers on this planet, but your will to be accomplished over all the planet of the earth when all of planet earth is subjected to the lordship of Jesus Christ and he rules as king of kings and lord of lords from Jerusalem over all of planet earth. In Romans 14, 17 through 18, it explains this further when it says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God right now cannot be seen with physical natural eyes, but it is a kingdom of righteousness in the hearts and lives of those who have experienced his righteousness. We've exchanged our sin to him and his righteousness to us and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on and tells us in verse 18, for he who serves Messiah, for he who serves Christ, in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Wow. So living out his kingdom, even in the midst of the circumstances which we live, is a kingdom of what? Righteousness, a kingdom of what? Peace, and a kingdom of what? 
joy in the Holy Spirit. Wow. You mean you and I can access righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit in these difficult days and trying times? Sure we can. It was interesting, the other day the president was commenting about the vice president, talking about how he is a force of, of uh, uh, what was the word he used? A force of stability for the nation, how he brought peace when he spoke. And I thought, you know, our vice president is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, a strong, strong, powerful believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he has peace, when he speaks, he's able to bring forth that peace to others as well. And it shows again that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those things don't change when our circumstances change. Whether you're the early church being distressed by Caesar and being thrown to the lions, or whether we're the modern church under home quarantine in a comfortable house waiting for a pestilence to pass over, our righteousness based on Jesus Christ, our peace based on our relationship with him, and our joy based on our relationship with him, all comes from the Holy Spirit, and all will be there to be accessible to give out to others. Amen? For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, in Luke 17, 20 through 21, continuing on this thought, in verse 20 it says, Now when he, Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. See, they were looking at that time for the physical arrival of Messiah's kingdom. When Messiah came, they thought the kingdom, the physical kingdom of God was coming with him. That's why they were so confused. They had missed that part of the prophecies of the scripture. So the Pharisees asked him, when would the kingdom of God would come? He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is where? Is within you. So right now, the kingdom of God is within us. But then in context... And I'm not going to read it, but you can look it up. In context, as you go on and read, he begins to give the signs of the times of the end. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Speaking of, the physical kingdom will come. But right now, the kingdom of God is within us. Why? Because the king and our life is subjected to him and submitted to him. So this is the kingdom of God. But when Jesus rules and reigns from planet Earth, all the nations of the world will be subjected to him and will be submitted to him. That will be the kingdom of God at that time. In Matthew 6, 6 through 10, <clears throat> again, we were saying, as Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom is within us now, but one day soon we'll be on earth Physically, that's part of eternal life. That's part of the promise of Heavenly Father to us as believers. That we're alive. One day we're going to be resurrected to new bodies if you die. Or your bodies are going to be changed either way. And you're going to have an opportunity to be a partaker of the physical kingdom of Jesus Christ on planet Earth for a thousand years. That's exciting. That sure beats the fairy tales of floating around on the clouds looking like a baby playing harps for the rest of eternity. Heavenly Father has a purpose and has a plan. Amen? I'm excited about what the Lord has for our future. As a matter of fact, I believe if more of us understood and had faith in the future plan that the Lord has for His people, we wouldn't be so tied to planet Earth. Yes, there's things we need to be doing here, but I'm talking about we wouldn't be so fearful of when this body passes on to sleep until the resurrection. Pray for God's will, saints, to be done on earth as his will is done in heaven. Heavenly Father's will is always done in heaven. Amen? Right now, his will is accomplished, supposed to be accomplished through the life of his people. That's why he says to humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. Why? So that our lives will be submitted to the will of God. Amen.
to the will of God. You see, what we do is we take such a casual approach that we submit our life in areas we want to submit. In other areas we don't, we just choose to, <laughs> I'm not going to mess with that. But Heavenly Father wants all of us, all of the time. Say that with me. All of us, all of the time. Very good. Let's continue. This will only be accomplished when our king returns to this earth. And where the king is, is his kingdom. Amen? Where the king is, is his kingdom. Where Jesus is, is his kingdom. Where is Holy Spirit right now? The Bible says when we commit our life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, he placed a guarantee of his spirit within us. And so the king is in us. And this is where his kingdom is right now. Amen? And he will return to the earth. We want his will to be done now in our lives. Now in our lives. Like I said, he's giving the earth and the nations of the world a time out. Giving them a time out. Have you ever given your children a time out? You give them a time out to think about what they did that wasn't right. To give them a pause. You don't do it because you don't love them. You do it because you do love them. He's giving the nations a pause. Now I know we live in a time and we live in an age where most preachers don't believe that God judges sin, that most preachers don't believe that judgments come from God, everything's blamed on the devil. But I want you to know that's not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, quite on the contrary. God is the only one who can judge righteously and can judge true. And we in these end times have got to have more discernment in our life. I see this, and, and I'm not saying that God's judgment is in him lifting his hand off so that the enemy can come in and do his thing. However you, whatever in your mind makes you feel more comfortable, I guess, all I know is the judgment of God is the judgment of God. There's no getting around it, guys. And it's not to scare us. It's to bring us back to a place where the church is the church. Listen, Jesus died for the church. He died for the church that he is looking for, that bride who's perfect and without spot and without blemish. He's not wanting us to make church in, his, in our own image, and that's what we've done, especially in the West. We've made church what we want church to be, not God's design and God's plan. How do I know that? Because we're not seeing the, the, the reaping of souls. We haven't seen. We can now because I don't think the church will ever be the same after this. I think people will re-examine their lives. I think there will be a great harvest. But what sort of disciples will we make of this harvest? Will we bring uh, people in to become lukewarm like others are lukewarm? Or will we bring people and sweep, will Holy Spirit sweep people into the kingdom of God to become fires and flames for his kingdom? That's what we're praying one day soon, his kingdom will be established on this earth. Will be established on this earth. Amen? That's a great hope, guys. So when you see the earthquakes, if you notice how many earthquakes there have been, some weird places, we keep, need to keep uh, Pastor Mario and his wife in our prayers. I believe it was a week ago or so they experienced an earthquake there in Croatia in the capital city. He wrote to me, they're fine, they're safe. Uh, but it caused a lot of damage out there to a lot of the buildings. And uh, there was an earthquake uh, just uh, the other day here in Texas, in El Paso, um, where I don't think there's been an earthquake before. I mean, there's just earthquakes springing up, as always, all over the place. Jesus said, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, he says, earthquakes in diverse places in these different places that you hadn't seen earthquakes take place in before. So one day soon his kingdom will be established on the earth. And all of the earth is groaning in travail to bring this about. I want to share with you guys something the Holy Spirit showed me. So as we see the kingdom of God soon one day approaching, we know this. We know that the earth in travail is like a woman in crisis, like a woman in uh, 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 pregnancy, a woman in labor pains, and those labor pains are increasing. 
Now, as those labor pains are increasing, the final result of that pain and of that travail is going to be the new birth of a little human being, a precious baby. And regardless of the pain and the difficulty that it takes, they're looking forward to that moment. I've yet to ever meet a woman who said that her labor pains just felt beautiful and were wonderful. None of them, no lady has ever been happy about the labor pains, but without that pain, without that travail, without that distress, there is no birth. So without the travail, without the distress of the nations, and this, Jesus said, is only the beginning of sorrows, without that distress, without that that, that travail, there is no birth. There is no arrival of the kingdom of God. So these things are set forth to usher in and to birth the future kingdom of God and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. When that happens, then only God's will will be done by the inhabitants of the earth. Satan will be locked up for a thousand years and only the will of God. Can you imagine living on a planet that only God's will is done? Individuals' will is submitted to his will? Satan's been locked away? He can no longer deceive the nations for a thousand years? Wow, what an incredible, beautiful time of peace that will be. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8 through 11, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now listen to me, saints. Jesus was physically standing on the Mount of Olives. Physically standing there. And as he was physically standing there, he was caught up into heaven with Heavenly Father. And they stood there, it says in verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, obviously, these were two angels. And look what they said to him. Who also said, men of Galilee... Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now listen, I don't fault the disciples for this one because if I had been in this circumstance, in this situation, I would have been standing there just mouth open, eyes wide open like softballs. But they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Listen to me, saints. The same way in which Jesus left, he's coming back. Jesus left the earth physically. He will return physically. He left the earth from the Mount of Olives. He will return physically to the Mount of Olives. Jesus left from the Mount of Olives, and that's where he's coming back. In Luke 17, 22, it says, Then he said to his disciples, The time will come when you wish you could see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. There will be those who will say to you, look over there or look over here, but don't go out looking for it. As the lightning flashes across the sky and lights it up from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Listen, when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, it will be a birthing event. The eastern sky will roll back like a scroll and the Lord Jesus Christ will return with the saints of God to establish his kingdom on planet earth. <clears throat> Isaiah 34, 4 prophesies that day. It says, the sun, the moon, the stars will crumble to dust. The sky will disappear. Look at what it says. The sky will disappear like a scroll being rolled up. And the stars will fall like leaves dropping from a vine or a fig tree. In Revelation 6, 13 through 14, it tells us almost word for word the same thing. <laughs> it says, and the stars fell down to the earth like unripe figs falling from the tree when a strong wind shakes it. The sky disappeared like a what? Like a scroll being rolled up. Wow. The same phraseology, same terminology used in Isaiah 34, 4. 
like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Can you imagine the shaking of the earth that will occur on that day? The day, the great and notable day of the Lord, when he returns to move every mountain and island from its place? So in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Ten thousands of his saints, saints. That's you, that's me, that's all the other believers. And literally, it's myriads and myriads and chiliads and chiliads, this innumerable host of heaven that are coming when the Lord returns. So to execute judgment on all. What? I thought God doesn't judge anything. I thought there is no judgment. I thought God just winks at the world, at everything that's done. He doesn't judge anything. That's not what the Bible teaches. And to all my preacher and pastor friends, that is not what the Bible teaches. It says to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against who? Against him. Saints, if you don't believe in the judgment of God, you're missing the whole arena of repentance. The Bible says when the apostle Paul spoke to the governor Felix, about the judgment to come that Felix trembled. That was a part of the gospel, and we've lost that. And here we're in the midst of, listen to me, the nations of the planet are shut down, and we still don't believe it's a judgment from God. Man has done wickedly, saints, wickedly. Killed hundreds of millions of innocent babies. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Now I saw heaven open, John the Revelator says, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. In righteousness he judges. Listen, saints, you can't judge, I can't judge, but Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, in righteousness he judges. And his judgments are true, and today he brings judgment, not to bring destruction, but to bring repentance. The judgments of God on the nation of Israel, throughout all of the Old Testament, throughout all of Israel's history, was always for the purpose of bringing the nation of Israel and God's people back to a place of repentance. From a place where they had forsaken God. And sometimes their forsaking God was their words were fervent, but their actions were far from God. They always said the right things, but their actions always did the opposite. His eyes, it says in Revelation 19, 12, were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The Word of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrected Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Why are they in fine linen? Because they've been washed by the blood of Messiah, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that's the Word of God, and with it he should strike the nations. This is speaking in context about the final battle at the Battle of Armageddon, at the descent of the Lord. And he himself, Jesus himself, will rule them with a rod of iron. Now that's a reference to a pottery tool, saints. Whenever a potter would make a vase or make something, it had a flaw in it. After it dried or after it hit the kiln, he would take a rod of iron, he would strike and break it and throw that into the potter's field. It would be thrown into a waste pile for the broken pieces that couldn't be fixed. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, saints, Jesus is reaching out to you. For you and I, this is a pause in life. It's a time out for the world. For God's people, called by his name, humble themselves, pray, seek his face, draw near to him, turn off the distractions at home, turn off the entertainments at home, fast and pray in secret. Don't tell others what you're doing, and Heavenly Father will reward the body of Christ worldwide openly. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your great mercy, Father. Thank you for your great love. The judgments of God are never to bring destruction, Lord, but to bring an opportunity of repentance, to shake the very foundations that mankind has built their life upon, those false foundations of the gods of gold and silver and iron and clay and of wood, hay, and stubble. And you've shaken the nations to their core. Lord, this is an opportunity for your people to draw away from others, but to draw close to you. An opportunity to humble ourselves and to seek your face. An opportunity, Lord, to have you heal our land. An opportunity, Father, so when this is over, our nation is different, Lord. We are different. Your church, not just in this nation, but around the world, is different, Lord. Those things which seem so important, all of a sudden are recognized as not being important at all. But those things that are eternal, those things that matter. And if anyone's listening within the sound of my voice, and they've never surrendered their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I pray today that they'd fall on their knees, they'd humble themselves, call out to you, Lord, ask you to forgive them for their sin, to live big within their life, that they turn from their ways and from their will and turn towards you and towards going your way from this day forward. And in response, Father, hear from heaven. Make them a new creation, a new person, a Messiah. Let all things become new. Those whose hearts have been anxious, let them now have peace like a river. In the name of Jesus and all of God's people said,